Good morning. Welcome to Moreland Presbyterian Church. I'm Brian Marsh, the pastor. It's great to see you all here uh, on this super Sunday morning. And uh, a welcome to all of you who are joining us online as well. It's great to have this chance to be together once again to celebrate, to uh, give thanks, and uh, to give uh, worship and praise to the one who gives us life. Um, and uh, as we do that this morning, we do have quite a bit to celebrate. This is a special Sunday in the life of our community of faith uh, because immediately following this worship service, we're going downstairs for a super chili bowl supper, which uh, you are going to have a chance to taste uh, at least 10 different kinds of chili and all the fixins and cornbread and everything uh, that's been prepared by several members of our Moreland community. We'll also be having our congregational celebration and annual meeting uh, following that meal as well. So we invite all of you to come down for the meal directly following uh, worship this morning. I also want to mention that uh, we've had a birthday in our, uh, in our community. Uh, dear Gloria, Gloria, will you raise your hand? Gloria just celebrated uh, a very special birthday. Which number was this, Gloria? 94. I was going to say 95, but I didn't want to get ahead of myself. 94 years old, and so I think in honor of a 94th birthday, we need to join in a rousing chorus of happy birthday. Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. As we do in my house, <laughs> happy day and year ahead to you, Gloria. We're so thankful to get to celebrate with you. I am thankful to have uh, some uh, wonderful worship leaders with me this morning. Uh, Amelia Chapman is here from our middle school group, and um, we will also be having Brennan Wildermuth, our youth director, as one of our leaders, and also uh, Margot Coleman as one of our readers, uh, as we have several of our Logo students here for the Logos Choir today. So as we enter into our time of worship together, I invite you to stand as you are able for our call to worship. The words are above you on the screens, and as always, your part is in bold. Lord, open unto us. Light for our darkness. Courage for our fear. Hope for our despair. Lord, open unto us. Peace for our turmoil. Joy for our sorrow. Strength for our weakness. Lord, open unto us. Wisdom for our confusion. Forgiveness for our sins. Love for our enemies. Lord, open unto us. Yourself for ourselves. Amen. Our hymn of praise is Come Sing, O Church in Joy. It's number 305 in your hymnal.
Please be seated. Okay, how many of you made New Year's resolutions? I see quite a few hands. How many of you have broken those New Year's resolutions? Yeah, I see all the hands. You know, it's one of those things we do every year. It's kind of a natural thing, or at least we think about it, even if we don't commit ourselves to it. And we enter into them with the best intentions. And often we're able to even keep them for a while. But by the time we're into the second month of the year, at least if you're like me, they've kind of faded off into the distance in the dim, dark past. Well, when we come to a time of reflection and release, we are able to pause and recognize both the aspirations and hopes and dreams that we have in our lives and also the ways that those hopes and dreams and wishes don't come to pass. The ways that we fall short in life, just as we've also been incredibly blessed in life. And we can come into this space bringing all of that because we are celebrating the presence of the one who knows all of that, the one who's well acquainted with all of our ups and downs in life and who travels with us every step of the way, not with accusation, but with acceptance and with understanding and grace. So I invite us now to enter into a time of reflection and release. We'll do that first with some moments of silence. Let's join together in prayer. In the name of the one who knows us fully and loves us freely. Amen. In Jesus the Christ, strength is manifest in weakness. Wisdom reveals itself in foolishness. Life emerges out of death. And love resurrects hope. This is the good news for all of us. We are accepted, we are forgiven. We are loved. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our grateful response. Now, friends, the peace of Christ be with you all. I invite you to turn to one another, share the peace of Christ with one another, and to all of you joining us online, peace of Christ be with you.
For our uh, time with children, we have our logo square. You guys are awesome. Way to sing and shout and pray and clap. Good job. And now we'd like to invite all children here, Logos and otherwise, to follow Jan Martins uh, for a time of, uh, of Sunday morning story. A reading from the book of Zechariah, chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. The word of Yahweh was addressed to me as follows. I burn with passion for Zion. I am fiercely protective of it. Yahweh says this. I am returning to Zion, the holy mountain, and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, which will be called the faithful city. Yahweh says this. Old women and old men will sit again in the squares of Jerusalem, each leaning on staffs because of their advanced years. And the squares of the city will be filled with girls and boys playing happily. Yahweh says this, If this resembles a miracle to the remnant of this people, will it also seem a miracle to me? Yahweh says this, now I will save my people from the east countries and the west countries, and I will return them to live in Jerusalem. They will be my people, and I will be their God in faithfulness and integrity. When John's messengers had left, Jesus began to talk about John to the crowds. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the breeze? What really did you go out to see? Someone dressed in fine clothes? No, those who dress in fine clothes and live luxuriously are to be found in mansions. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and much more than a prophet. This is the one about whom scripture says, I send my messenger ahead of you to prepare your way before you. I tell you, there is no one born of woman who is greater than John, 
but the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he is. All of the people who heard him, even tax collectors, acknowledged God's experts on uh, God's goodness because they had received baptism from John. The Pharisees and the ex experts on the law had, on the other hand, had thwarted God's plans for themselves because they had refused John's baptism. Jesus continued, To what can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They are like people sitting in the marketplace and calling out to one another. We piped you a tune, but you wouldn't dance. We sang you a dirge, but you wouldn't weep. What I mean is that John the baptizer came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you said he's demon-possessed. The chosen one came and both ate and drank, and you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Wisdom, whoever, is vindicated by all her children. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Amen. And thank you, Margo and Amelia. You both rock. And let's join together in prayer. Gracious God, we are thankful for your spirit, your presence among us, and for these ancient words that speak into our very present lives in ways that invite us, in ways that perplex us, but in ways that open us and stretch us and spark our imaginations. May we hear these words afresh and anew today in ways that speak into our lives to empower us to be the people that you've created us to be. So may the words of my mouth, the thoughts and dreams and meditations of our hearts be a delight to you, for God, you are our delight. We pray in Christ's name, amen. And now that we just had our eyes closed, I'd like to invite you to close your eyes once again. And if you'd like to go to sleep, you are more than welcome to do that, which some of you do anyway whenever I talk. But I invite you to close your eyes and to open your imagination. Open your imagination to a broad, beautiful meadow on a brilliant, bright summer day. And you walk out into the meadow and you lie down in the grass. And there are some scattered trees around the meadow, including a tree just behind you. And as you're looking up, you're feeling the breeze blowing over your face. And you're taking in the beauty, the brilliance of your surroundings. And you're looking up into the sky, and you can feel a sense of anticipation growing within you, like something out of the ordinary could happen on a day like today that maybe an unexpected vision would happen, that maybe some kind of amazing appearance could appear. You find yourself growing in anticipation, expectation, and you open your arms and lay them out beside you in the grass, and you open your palms as if you're opening yourself up to the sky, to the heavens. And your anticipation and expectation grows stronger and deeper. And that wind continues to blow gently over your body and the grass and you see the brilliant blue of the sky. And you might even find yourself whispering something like, please, please, God, whatever it is, 
Let me see it. You wonder if the sky itself might part and reveal some kind of glorious splendor. And yet all you see is the blue and all that you hear is the silence. And you keep waiting and wondering and hoping and still, just the stillness, just the silence. And then... Two branches of the tree behind you wrapped together, clack, clack. And that's it. No sky parting, no grand revelation. And yet you feel a sense of excitement, of perplexing joy welling up within you wondering how, why, what does this mean? Does it need to mean anything? The writer Frederick Buechner had this experience one day on his family farm in Rupert, Vermont. And he wrote a novelized version of the experience later in his book, The Final Beast. And as he, the protagonist in the story, went on to relate, maybe all of this journeying had been only to bring him here to hear two branches hit each other twice like that. To see nothing cross the threshold, but to see the threshold itself. To hear the dry clack, clack of the world's tongue at the approach of the approach of splendor. What exactly did that mysterious clack, clack end up meaning to Buechner? Well, in the novel, he goes on and has the protagonist run in that inexpressible joy back to the barn to tell his friend about the experience, and he grabs two dead branches from the ground and starts wrapping them together in a really strange, erratic pattern and starts leaping up and down like a madman, and he says to his friend, could you dance to that? Could you dance to that rhythm? And his friend's looking at him like, I think maybe he found some wild mushrooms out in the meadow. And yet he goes on rapping and leaping and hopping and asking that question, could you dance to that? Could you dance to that? And his friend doesn't know what to say. And then eventually the protagonist stops and reflects. I think it's reality. It's this air that we breathe. It's the emptiness that we so often feel if you could get a hold of it by the corner somewhere, if you could just stick your fingernail underneath and peel it back like a curtain enough to find what's there behind the curtain, I think of the dance that must go on back there way in the deep and the heart of space. If we saw any more of that dance than we do, it would kill us for sure. The sheer glory and brilliance of it. Clack, clack is all a mere mortal can bear. Well, today we have a chance to consider two extraordinary visions of divine splendor Visions that collide with human expectations of how these visions should appear. What the splendor should look like. And the mysterious ways that wisdom reveals itself and manifests itself to expand our perceptions, to transcend 
our expectations. The prophet Zechariah shares a vision of a peaceable and intergenerational and inclusive kingdom. The God of hosts in the old language, literally meaning the God of all stars. God has created a sacred rhythm of life for all on earth and invites all to join in the divine dance. And yet that dance includes combinations of people that we don't expect to be combined together. And then generations later, Jesus is talking to a crowd about John the baptizer. And he repeatedly asks a very evocative question. What did you expect to see when you went to scope out John in the desert? Did you expect to see, as Eugene Peterson renders it, a weekend camper or a sheik in silk pajamas? No, you came to see a prophet, but a prophet with a scandalous message of the humble ones being exalted, the exalted ones being humbled, of the ordinary and inferior ones feeling the rhythm and joining in the dance, while the seemingly extraordinary and superior ones not stepping onto the dance floor because it's supposedly inappropriate. It's beneath them. And yet Jesus is here saying each person has a unique place on that dance floor, in the dance, and all are welcome to join in. And you've heard this message coming from one who's an ascetic, who doesn't eat or drink, and yet you've called him a demoniac. And now the message is coming from someone who does eat and drink, and you're calling him a drunkard and a glutton. Jeez, there's no pleasing you people, is there? But just watch. Just pay attention. You will see that wisdom you supposedly seek being lived out being played out right before your eyes through the ones who you least expect to display it. Now, how's that for a miracle? Clack, clack. And that echoes back to the God of all stars in Zechariah who says, do you hear all of this and think it will take a miracle to make it a reality? Do you think and wonder if I hear all of this and think it will take a miracle as well? Of course it will take a miracle. And each of you are a part of creating that miracle. You each have a voice You each have a place, a role, a presence to give in creating that miracle. And I think of the great theologian Jürgen Moltmann and his thoughts about miracles and how Moltmann describes miracles that we usually describe as being supernatural is actually in God's realm being natural. And that what we perceive as being natural in life is actually subnatural. Which leads me to wonder that if living out this miraculous vision of divine splendor is actually natural to us divinely human beings... Why do we spend so much of our time struggling and wallowing in subnaturalness, in suspicion of others, in selfishness and greed? Why do we waste so much energy creating factions that accuse and accost and demonize others? Why is this wisdom that emerges from this kind of vision so often perceived as being subversive, radical, 
coming from suspicious sources and therefore a threat to what we know as the status quo. All of that that we're comfortable with and familiar with. Why does it take a war in Ukraine or an earthquake in Turkey and Syria or a murder in Memphis or storming and flooding everywhere it seems to jolt us into this wisdom that we are actually better and stronger together? Why do we wait for stormy weather for the river to rise up to flooding, for people to come together and fill sandbags and care for and nurture each other and protect their communities. Well, maybe, just maybe, it has something to do with these wise words from Marianne Williamson. They're words that I have shared before. I will share them again until I have no more breath. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It's our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We are all meant to shine like children do. We were all born to make manifest the glory of God that's within us. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give others permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our mere presence automatically liberates others. And maybe these words are a reflection of the reality that the chosen one, the Christ, came to remind us that we are all chosen ones and that we are chosen to lean into and live out our chosenness in ways that don't divide us but unite us, in ways that don't polarize or ostracize but synthesize. Synthesize our uniquenesses into one eternal, expansive expression of that dazzling and divine splendor. And I think of the people in Ukraine that when Russia brought war to them and they were faced with this challenge of having to stand up and protect their own dignity and autonomy and freedom, Most people thought they would last a few days, maybe a couple weeks. And here they are over a year later. Not only surviving, but standing tall. Even growing gradually in strength. There is so much still to protect and ensure. There will be so much to rebuild And yet here they are leaning into the challenge and working together to create a miracle. A miracle of a reality in which their people are one, which is a reflection of the reality of all people being one. And I see that happening in other realms of life, in communities that have undergone incredible calamities through natural disasters and cities that have been devastated by violence and injustice and inequality and communities who see the greater needs around them and who are banding together in surprising ways, not just to meet the needs, but to embrace those beloveds as neighbors, as fellow co-creators, and co-travelers on this one journey of life as one beloved community. If John's message, in essence, was, wake up, clack, clack, and turn from all that leads you away from life and turn towards all that gives you life, 
then maybe the message of Zechariah and the message of Jesus is open up. Open up your minds, your hearts, your spirits, your perceptions, your expectations. Open up and pay attention. Pay attention to the revelations of that divine splendor all around you and among you and even within you. Listen for those invitations to join in that divine dance and move towards the dance floor and step onto it and start shaking what your mama gave you. Join in the celebration. Join in the creation of another miracle. Listen to the rhythm and move with it. Groove with it. Even if the rhythm only sounds like clack, clack. Amen. Join us now for a time of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for the gifts of creation and life. We thank you for Jesus, who embodied the fullness of divine love for us, all as one of us. We thank you that his love is greater than our fears and stronger than death itself. We thank you for the gift of your ever presence with us by your spirit. We pray today for those in our world, our community, and our lives who are in the greatest need, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and ask that you would not only provide for their needs, but remind us that we are sources of this provision of comfort, restoration, and healing. We think of those in our community who are moving through seasons of grief and loss, especially for the Needland family in the loss of dear Kathy and Josh Reynolds and the family in the loss of his mother, Lynn. We remember those in Turkey and Syria, Afghanistan and Palestine, Memphis and Monterey Park, and other places where conflict is a daily reality and so many people are living in harm's way. We pray for peace in your world, for the leaders of this nation and others, we continue to lift up all who are homeless and hungry in our neighborhood and beyond. We thank you for the ways you are making your loving and healing presence known through so many who are working to rebuild communities and restore people's lives. In the flurry of busyness and worries in our lives today, help us to abide in stillness and listen to the sacred silence for your gentle wisdom to guide and empower us. In the seeming absence of hope and love in our world today, May we sense your presence with us and within us, gracious God, empowering us to be the vessels of hope and love that we are created to be. Remind us that in a world needing miracles of healing and recovery, we are instruments of peace and manifestations of the miraculous. May we hear the rhythm of the spirit and respond by joining the dance of all creation and inviting others to join as well. Amen. Thanks, Brennan. As our life together continues, I did mention earlier that we're having a party uh, following worship downstairs in the dining hall, our super chili bowl Sunday. All are invited to come and enjoy the meal and conversation and fun. Um, members of the deacons, congregational life, and youth ministries and others have done a pretty incredible job uh, with a beautiful setup down there, so we hope that you'll join us uh, immediately following worship. 
Uh, other parts of our life continue on as they do. Uh, you'll see those listed in your bulletin. Just a reminder that we have two weekly uh, scripture study conversation groups. Tuesday morning is in person at Bob's Red Mill at 8 a.m. Wednesday morning is on Zoom online at 8 a.m. All ages and stages, all genders are welcome to join in. And as we move further into uh, this season, we are gearing up for the Lenten season. And wanted to let you know that uh, we will be having uh, a service of worship on Ash Wednesday at 7 p.m. right here at Moreland. There will be more information about that in the days ahead in the e-notes, so look for that. And uh, then we will be having a Lenten series. And that Lenten series will be starting the first Sunday in Lent, which is the last Sunday of this month, the 26th. And that will be a time for dinner and for conversation uh, and for uh, more in-depth conversation around a video series from the streaming uh, video series called The Chosen, which some of you may have heard about. Uh, the Chosen is uh, a very creative depiction of Jesus and the first followers of Jesus. Uh, and we will be uh, selecting uh, episodes from that series, and we'll be having conversation around them, as well as dinner. And that will be happening right here in the sanctuary. The front area here is going to become a dinner theater. And we invite you to come. Uh, it will be a potluck supper, followed by video watching on the big screen, and then conversation around the tables. If you have questions about that and want to find out more information, you can see Kirsten Marsh, uh, and she would love to get you involved and for all of us uh, to connect with that in one way or another. The uh, last thing I wanted to mention is that our youth ministry is doing a lot of exciting things, and that is including uh, updating, renovating the youth area. Leanne, did you want to come up and say something about that? Um, Brennan has already got the ball rolling with uh, a fresh coat of paint and, uh, and other uh, updates to the uh, youth area. Uh, but Leanne has some other ways for you to become involved in that. So the coolest room in this whole church happens to be off of the, um, the dining room where we're going to have chili. You should go take a look. Brennan, our youth director, has been doing a great job of remodeling. It it's, looks so good. And now all we need is a little more fun down there. So if you happen to think about maybe your garage or your attic, or maybe if you have a ping pong table collecting dust, or an Xbox, or a flat screen TV, or board games, any of that stuff that maybe you're not using anymore, we have a place for it downstairs. So just reach out to me, Brian or Brennan. Um, we can facilitate a pickup, okay? Thank you. Thanks, Leanne. Yes, that old pool table that has become a storage table for you. We can use that. Um, and any other items like that, please let us know. We would love to uh, continue to freshen up uh, that youth area, which is really the coolest room in, in our property. Friends, uh, as we come to a time of offering, we come with hearts that are filled with gratitude because each breath, each heartbeat is a gift, let alone each resource that we are given, that we have the opportunity to share. Human resources, financial resources, physical resources, all of the above uh, are gifts to us. And we are so thankful for all the ways that you share those gifts. And so in that spirit of gratitude, let's present our gifts and tithes and offerings.
Friends, as we give thanks for God's amazing and incredible gifts in our lives, let's do that through praying the prayer that Jesus taught his first followers to pray, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, holy be your name. Thy you come, thy will be done on earth as it is heaven. Give us this day our day bread, and forgive us our debts. As we are our debtors, and we are sent to temptation, and to us the evil, the vice the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thanks, Ian. Our hymn of sending is Alleluia, Laud, and Blessing, number 755 in your hymnal. you to open your hands. Can you dance to that? Well, I don't think I can either, but maybe we can. As erratic as the rhythm of life may be, there's always a deeper rhythm underneath and within. Listen to that rhythm. Listen to that pound, pound, thump, thump, clack, clack of your heart, your pulse, your breath. And know that indeed, even when you don't feel like you do, you have rhythm. You are rhythm. So remember that. Know that in the depths of your heart and soul. And be that this day, this week ahead. May God bless us and keep us. May God's face shine upon us. May God's grace shine within us. May God's loving and life-giving presence be with us, within us, among us, around us, behind us, and beyond us, this day and every day. All God's children say, Amen. Amen. And now please be seated for our musical benediction.
And now head downstairs. The chili is awaiting and the conversation and the celebration. Peace be with you all.